You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wyatt, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, JT Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Ford, Corey, Dr. O, Brandon Sanders, Robin Mom, Ernest Klein, Jim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is Fiona David. Thanks for tuning in to Author Stories. We've got a great show lined up for you today. Be sure to go to HankGarner.com and subscribe to the show. No matter how you listen, Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Stitcher Radio, Pandora, Spotify, or YouTube, you can subscribe to the show and never miss an episode. I'd like to thank some sponsors today. Scribophile is a respectful online writing workshop and writer's community. Writers of all skill levels join to improve each other's work with thoughtful critiques and by sharing their writing experiences. We're the writing group to join if you want to find beta readers, get the best feedback around, learn how to get published, and be a part of the friendliest and most successful writing workshop online. Improve your writing by receiving detailed critiques. Learn from a vast collection of free writing resources. Make lifelong friends in our busy community of writers. Writing is a solitary art, but that doesn't mean you have to be lonely. Lucky for you, there are thousands of writers on Scribophile every day, and we're a really friendly bunch. You've never seen a writing group like this one. Join Scribophile today at Scribophile.community. For the Words is a unique writing motivator unlike anything I've seen. For the Words is an online writing platform which motivates writers of all backgrounds to increase their word count through gamification. Writing can be challenging, especially when you need to consistently produce a high output of words. By injecting a little fun into the routine and using daily rewards to promote a healthy writing habit, For the Words makes it easier to reach that word count. We're a community of bloggers, professional authors, college and high school students, research scientists, gamers, and first-time writers from all over the world. Come for the words, stay for the fun. Go to four, that's the number four, thewords.com. Both Sides of the Law, the Casper Halliday NYPD series, book one by Nathan Roden. He shared his father's dream of becoming a detective. A prison sentence was not part of his plan. Casper Halliday's dream began to unravel two months before his 16th birthday. His father, Bobby, resigned from the NYPD after 15 years without an explanation. Casper's parents fought. Sirens closed in on their home from every direction. The sound that had always been a source of comfort now brought only humiliation. Bobby Halliday moved out. Casper's dream dissolved into a daily fight for survival. All he wanted now was to finish high school so he could ease his mother's burden. On his 17th birthday, in the throes of depression, Casper made a bad decision. That decision brought him face to face with one of the most dangerous men in the city. In Casper's world, there is laughter and there are tears. There's light and there's bitter darkness. There are improbable friends and unspeakable enemies. The Casper Halliday NYPD series launches with the most unlikely of beginnings. Read both sides of the law today. The ebook edition includes a sneak peek of Ghost Man, book two in the series. Writers, the internet is one of the best tools for research and creativity. It can also be one of the biggest hindrances to productivity, distracting you from doing the the seat-in-the-chair, hand-on-keyboard work. Rescue Time gives you an accurate picture of how you spend your time to help you become more productive every single day. Spot inefficiencies in your day and become better at managing your time. Create a goal like spending less than one hour per day on email to help you stay focused. Set an alarm to tell you when you spent more than two hours on Facebook. Try Rescue Time and use our special discount code for 30% off a Rescue Time premium account by going to rescuetime.com slash author stories. Let us help you rescue your time.
Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I'm super excited to have my friend Fiona Davis back on the show for for visit number three, I believe it is. And we're going to be talking uh, about her brand new book, The Chelsea Girls, that uh, when you're hearing this is out available everywhere. And just like her previous releases, these are some of the most unique historical fiction stories I've ever read. And uh, with Chelsea Girls, you have completely shattered all expectations. Uh, Welcome back to the show, Fiona. Oh, thank you so much. I'm, I'm just delighted to be back. And thank you for your kind words. I'm super excited to have you back. Um, this has been uh, a crazy couple of years. We were we were talking just before we started recording. And uh, how does it feel to be um, the person that has kind of uh, forged a new genre uh, all for yourself with these place based historical fiction novels that you, you've really made a name for yourself there? How does that feel? Oh, it's has been fantastic beyond my wildest dreams and this is really my third career so it really feels like everything I've done in the past from acting to journalism has all kind of coalesced in in what I'm doing now so it just feels right um and I'm enjoying I think being a little older I'm enjoying every minute of it I'm glad I'm not in my 20s <laughs> um yeah so it's it's just been just been terrific and you know, it is it is surprising that no one considered creating a series based around landmark buildings. Um, but at the same time, there's so many wonderful books that are, you know, where the building really becomes a character. I do feel like I'm just building on these authors and, and novels that have come before me. Right. Well, the this the series and I'm doing air quotes over series here. If you, it, it, it's, it's not really a series, but there are some some defining threads that run through your books. Um, began with the dollhouse, and then uh, and then the address, and then after the address, uh, the masterpiece, and now the Chelsea Girls. When I, I know you you did not grow up in New York, um, but what was the initial fascination? That um, you know, you New York is is kind of a a fantasy place already, um, full of these 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 unique places, and and you know there's a rich history. Um, when you have that many people coming in and out, and then multiply that by you know a, a hundred years or so, um, those stories just get amplified and grow and grow and grow. What, what was the the first draw for you to to start picking a place and then imagining? the history of that place. Yeah, you know, you're so right that New York is this kind of magic city. It's so interesting because just the other day I was walking down my street and it's this tree-lined street with all these brownstones and it had just finished raining and it was at night so the light was picking up all the shininess from the puddles and the, the, the leaves. And I really for a minute just stopped and said, it's almost like I'm in a movie set. It's so beautiful. <laughs> And there's something just magical about the city in that way. And I think for me, having been here now for two or three decades, I've seen my neighborhood change. I've seen the city change. And so you're watching these layers and layers of history growing every, you know, every five years, something changes and you wonder, oh, right, that building used to be that. Now it's something completely different. And realizing that that's happened throughout the, the since you know New York was here in the 15 and 1600s, it's just a city that that grows and it's like shark teeth where one something disappears and then a new tooth comes in, uh, and um and so it, I find it fascinating just exploring that history and and the ghosts that are left behind, and how does a place change its inhabitants over time? Right. You know, we talk a lot about um, when someone has a, a strong uh, voice uh, in writing, uh, they tend to create places that almost become characters. And, and we talk about place as character a lot, and, and that can encompass a lot of things from the, the people of that place and their mannerisms and common uh, phrases and, and things like that to the, the climate and, and how maybe a place with oppressive heat uh, tends to, uh, you know, change the mood of people. Um, 
your your books literally the place is a character and and we we can talk about all the metaphorical ways that is but but it literally is is a character in the book um when you're when you pick a place how do you start to uh to get the history of the is is there a place that you go to where you can really dig into the the physical history of a place and then how do you start digging through what uh you know the people that might have been there and the the specific flavor uh of the the people that might be there yeah that's such a good question i think it helps having been a journalist um you know the first thing i do is i read everything i can on the building and often here in new york there's been some remarkable books written about the history and the layers of the building um for the the chelsea girls a woman named cheryl tippins wrote a book called inside the dream palace and it's tales from the legendary Chelsea Hotel. And it's an incredible nonfiction book about the characters who've passed through. And she was lovely enough to meet me for a glass of wine and answer my questions and, and share some of her research. And, and so that's, it's really finding the right people to talk to. There's another, he's just a, a New York resource, uh, an architectural historian named Andrew Alpern. And he, he's one of the first people I call and say, hey, let's meet for lunch when I have a building in mind, because he has kept over the years clippings and articles on everything to do with New York. And if I have any questions, I go to him. So it's funny, but it really is the people who drive the process and, and finding these, these just resources. Um, who who are able to help me out and and kind of give me the the backstory and the and throw out story ideas that I might not have considered otherwise. You have chosen different periods of time uh, to cover in your books, and and e- each time you do, there's a there's a particular story there. There's a particular group of people, and and there's maybe. Um, a societal thing going on that that is played a, a specific specific part in this specific time. Um, the Chelsea Hotel that you chose for the Chelsea Girls um, is one of these legendary places, and and <laughs> legendary for a lot of different reasons from from a lot of different <laughs> time periods. I mean, you know, uh, it literally runs the gamut. Um, first off, did you did you choose the Chelsea Hotel? because of the hotel and then find out the stories behind it? Or did you know some stories that led you to the Chelsea Hotel? I knew some stories. And and to be honest, the hotel really intimidated me because there are so many decades of fascinating stories in its history. Um, You know, it was built in 1884 as a cooperative. And the idea was that it would be very utopian where you'd have a plumber living next to a musician Um, There were 15 artist studios on the top floor, and that unfortunately went bankrupt, and it became a hotel. And as you were mentioning, the guests who have passed through the doors include Dylan Thomas, Bob Dylan, Leonard Cohen, Sid Vicious, and then you have the more kind of cultured types like Arthur Miller and Thomas Wolfe and Virgil Thompson. And um, and so for me, I, I knew I wanted to do a story there, but there were so many ways in. You know, it wasn't like the other buildings where something snagged me and I thought, oh, yeah, that's what I'll do. Here, as I was reading about the history, there was a lot to choose from and a lot of different decades to choose from. I knew I wanted to set it um, in kind of the, the late 60s, early 70s part of it just because that's that Leonard Cohen, Janis Joplin time. Um, and, and, but the other, the other section and the real story behind the story was up for grabs until I, I had a remarkable interview um, that really changed the direction of the book. Tell us about that interview. Yeah, if you can. So I, yeah sure. It, it's, a, it's an actress named Virginia Robinson who was born in 1909. She was 98 um, when we last talked. And, but she, she just had this incredible level of detail to her memories. She'd been on tour with the USO as an actress. Um, she'd talk about how they'd crave orange juice and good and plenties while they were on tour. And that World War II, she said, was all about booze and sex. She told it 
she said it like it was. And then she came back to New York and she understudied Bay Ray and Vivian Lee and again had all these stories to tell. And then she started mentioning phrases and words that I just wasn't familiar with. She was talking about red channels and loyalty oaths. And she really became incensed when she realized I, I had no idea what she was talking about. And she just pointed a finger at me and said, look it up. <laughs> and so I did. And I learned of, about how the McCarthy era and the blacklist affected the New York theater at that time. And it became a story that I thought would be really interesting to tell because I know when anything surprises me, it'll probably surprise the reader. And so to read about what these actors went through and the intimidation and the, they were terrorized um, and, and kind of what was going on in the McCarthy era, which I knew of, but the details really, really got to me. And so that's where I thought, oh, great, because to be honest, the Chelsea Hotel was a hotbed of communism. Um, and so it was just a perfect mix of character and place. And when you found that little nugget of history that became the snag, didn't it? Yes. Oh, yeah. And then, and then that's when my heart starts beating. And I'm like, oh, I, I, I want to tell this story. Can I tell this story? Will I do it justice? And especially here, because I, I spoke with other actors and acting teachers who were caught up in the blacklist. And, and, you know, even though they were all in their 90s, it was as if 70 years hadn't passed. They were just as angry. They were just as livid. They were they were railing against the injustice and it made me kind of want to, to get this story out so other people could see what we lost um, at that time. When I think of uh, McCarthyism, if, if we have to put a name on it um, and think of that, that period of time, the, the thing I think about are the Hollywood actors and okay. uh, you know, those things I, I don't think about the 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 East Coast side of that and and the artists that that would have affected um, it, that's it was complete news to me as well yeah that's what surprised me you know I knew about the Hollywood 19 and the movie Trumbo um, but in New York it was a little more insidious it was more of a gray list and so while there was picketing and boycotting of, of Broadway shows that hired suspected artists, it wasn't really until Red Channels was published in 1950, and that was this this pamphlet that you could buy at a bookstore or a newsstand for one dollar, and it had lists of any actors who who were suspected of being communists, and under their names were a list of all their offenses, including if they donated clothing to Spanish refugees fleeing Franco, or if they lived in Greenwich Village, if they attended a conference for world peace at some point. Uh, and, and keep in mind, at that time, communism was legal. It was okay to be a communist. But with this printing of this booklet, it, it, the FBI started interviewing people's neighbors, going through their trash, bugging phones. Actors really began turning on each other. And, and then, it, you know, then I discovered it was this huge scam where the same people who published Red Channels would offer for a great, for a lot of money at the time for around two hundred dollars to clear actors' names, <laughs> and so it was this, and 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 it just became this thing that, that ate up um, the community, and so many people couldn't get hired if they were listed in red channels, and so really we have this black hole of artists and actors who who we don't know about because they couldn't work. Right. Well, it's a it's such a strange thing because artists naturally um, kind of uh, poke and prod at the status quo um, <laughs> yeah. and and make us uh, look at things that we don't necessarily want to look at um, and, and, and not always to endorse, uh, but just to, you know, make people think, to bring attention to, to to open a dialogue. Um, and to think that uh, back then, um, as as we are kind of approaching now as well, because history always repeats itself, um, <laughs> that the the idea of talking about ideas uh, gets you in mm -hmm. trouble. Um, the the Chelsea Hotel was this hotbed and this this magnet for artists. It, it's a, its entire life. It seems like. Um, what do you think it is about that place that attracts? those types of people that are instigators. <laughs> yeah, 
You know, I think part of it is the management. There was a, a manager there, um, David Bard, who who just felt like he, it's like he was a curator for personalities. And so he rarely had people sign leases. Once he moved in, you could stay for, you know, years, decades. Um, if you couldn't pay rent, you could pay in artwork, which he'd then hang on the, in the lobby. And, and so I think that kind of, um, it became a creative hotbed because he was bringing in people who were really interesting to him. Um, and so you had artists and musicians and poets and, and it just, and so then they would recommend it to their friends. And so like attracted like, and it, it just became this quirky place. It was very inviting yet very intimidating at the same time, very quirky. Um, I remember I was looking at the floor plans of the place and discovered a secret tunnel in the basement, which of course I had to use in the book. There was just all these interesting things going on. Um, you know, Arthur Miller moved there after his divorce from Marilyn Monroe. Edie Sedgwick was there. Uh, it just was a, an in, incredible um, place where people could exchange ideas, either artistic or political, with, with a sense of freedom and, and really challenge the status quo. Right. Um, this book, and uh, probably more so than uh, any of your previous books, you really get to uh, dig in and uh, in, and highlight um, one of your former lives in, in theater. Um, and from our first conversation, where you told us all about your uh, time that you spent in theater. Um, what was it that connected with you personally um, when you started getting to the story uh, of the Chelsea Hotel, these things that happened, these artists? Um, how did it how did it find a way to connect to you personally? I think part of it was remembering what it was like to be in my 20s and all of us putting on three shows a year and, you know, having one go to Broadway and get nominated for a Tony and just what a special journey that was. And even though we were all hanging the lights and, you know, designing the costumes ourselves, um, we, it, we were doing it for the art and to create something that was bigger than all of us. And there was this kind of mission to everyone do the best they can and, and, and support each other. And these are my friends still today from that time period. And so that was interesting. And then another thing that really helped me connect into it was um, I had a long talk with a, an acting teacher named Michael Howard, who was an actor in the fifties and was named and blacklisted and became an acting teacher um, because he could no longer work. And a very famous one who's, who's taught, you know, hundreds of thousands of students. And I remember we were, we were talking and he described having lunch with Clifford Odets, the playwright, who was a friend, and realizing during the course of the conversation that Odets had named names and probably turned him in. And, and he described it in a way only an acting teacher can do. But it, it, it was just so visceral the way he you know, his whole body changed and, and his face changed as he remembered what that betrayal was like. And, and so for me, again, that was a way in as, because the people I was talking to were so expressive and, and had such vivid memories. I was able to kind of plug in um, that way and create a, you know, a teacher who lives at the, at the Chelsea hotel. The, the book reads um, like, uh, like someone uh, who was a theater person wrote it. Um, it's, it's in three very distinct acts. Um, was that on purpose? Did, did you mirror, um, the, the art form in this book on purpose? No, no, it came, that came later. And then, wow. I, yeah. in a kind of a later, much later draft. And I, I even remember writing act one, act two, act three on the copy on the, on a manuscript and turning it into my editor and thinking, Oh, she might hate that. <laughs> you know, I, I thought, is that overkill? But it, I, I'm glad, I'm glad it works. It works. It just worked out. It's funny how that, that kind of thing happened. And um, yeah. And I, I, so I was very pleased the way it kind of comes full circle. And, and it's not a, um, it's it's not a gimmicky thing, but after at the end of the book, it it completely makes sense. Like this this story needed to be told that way. Um, yeah, so I, I I love that you did it that way. 
Oh, good. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. So, so let's let's get into the story here. Who is Hazel Ripley? So Hazel Ripley is a, a woman who comes from a theater family, the Ripleys, and um, and she the family has had some tragedy, and she's really the the person left to carry on the family name in the entertainment industry, and she's been a serial understudy on Broadway and is kind of in a rut. And so she signs up to go on tour with the USO and do something different. And she's ambitious, but quietly ambitious. She's not quite sure if this is the career for her because it really doesn't suit her nature. And once she starts writing, that's when it starts to connect and then she decides to become a playwright. And it's funny because it does parallel my journey, where as an actress, I enjoyed it. It was really fascinating. But when I began writing was when I realized, oh, this is what I should be doing. And that was that was quite a eye-opening time. Does Hazel become kind of an amalgam of you and the uh, uh, the, the woman that you did the uh, the interview with who, who told you all about the, the Red Scare? Yeah, oh, definitely. Virginia is, is very strongly in Hazel's character, although Virginia is actually more of a Maxine in, in real life, and probably. Um, so she's a little more, you know, seize the day and take the bull by the horns type person. And Hazel's not. She's happy to kind of hang in the background. But um, she's also an amalgam of Lillian Hellman, who was a playwright who was brought before the House on American Activities Committee. And and so I pulled in some some parts of Lillian Hellman's story as well. Nice. You mentioned Maxine. How does uh, Maxine come into the story, and what is her relationship to Hazel? So Maxine is already on tour when Hazel joins up, and she's kind of the one who knows how things run and um, is the leader of the group and isn't afraid to say exactly what she what she thinks. And the two of them get caught up in a, an incident that occurs um, in Naples that affects them both and kind of bonds them to each other. And they meet later in New York and carry on that friendship as they try to mount this play on Broadway during the, the blacklist. So um, how, do you, how do you weave in that story of the blacklist it, with these characters um, that uh, – how do you bring them into the the realities of that day, um, and, and what kind of threat do you put them under? You know, it for me, I have to figure out what their goals are, and both of them want to get this play up on Broadway. That's their goal, and um, it's a story they feel very close to because of their experience in Naples. And they have this real drive to do it well and do a good job, and. Um, and really make their names and make their careers in that way. And so by studying what happened to, uh, to actors at that time, it was easy to put roadblocks in their way um, that actually occurred. One tricky thing was that I wanted to make sure the timeline was correct. So Red Channels was published in June 1950, so I had to make sure that everything worked around those dates. And that was a first time for me to have to layer in a political timeline to my own character's timeline. Right. Um, yeah, so that was one of the challenges. But it, it really was just taking what had really happened and, and throwing it at my characters as they're trying to do what they're trying to do. When uh, you've always dealt with societal issues uh, that were going on at the time in your books, but like you said, this is the first time that you had to actually line up with a political timeline. What what challenges did that bring you, and did, did that ever stifle um, the 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 creative growth for the character that you had envisioned? You know, it, it was tricky for me plot wise because I knew what the plot had to be. And then t at times um, I was, I was really having a tough time. And, and luckily my agent who's terrific um, saved the day and said, Hey, let's switch these two events around. And suddenly it all started to work. Um, but that's where, that's where I, I had a little time, a little trouble as I was, um, working on early drafts. Um, but the, the characters, if anything, came to me really cleanly. You know, I, I, I really fell in love with them and enjoyed bringing them to life. And, and if anything, I wanted to do justice to the stories of the, the people I talked to, like Lee Grant, um, who was 
sweet enough to give me an interview. And, and she was someone who was nominated for an Oscar for her film debut in 1951 and then didn't work for 10 years because she refused to testify against her husband um, before HUAC. Uh, you know, and, and so for me, that was the tricky thing. The political timeline was interesting, and there are certain echoes to today that I found interesting. Um, but the main, my main issue was to make sure I, I got this, these people's story right, even though it was a fictional account. Right, right. Um, one of the temptations that, uh, that people will have when you're dealing with something like McCarthyism is to make it just bl a, a blatant mirror of what's going on in the world today. And, and not that there's anything wrong with talking about current um, you know, happenings and things like that in fiction, but it has to be done correctly or it just becomes kind of eye rollingly preachy and, <laughs> yeah. you know, and, and you do not do that whatsoever. Although there are many inferences that we can take um, lessons that we can learn by watching how other people made mistakes. And hopefully we see ourselves in that so that we don't make those mistakes. Um, is that a tricky thing to, to balance, to not get, um, to, to not let the present bleed into your fiction? It is. And you, you just put that so perfectly. I'm going to have to remember what you said when I'm on book tour. Um, <laughs> I'll have to remember too. <laughs> I'll remember. Because, because it is tricky. And, and, and I did cut some things where I, I could see that I was getting a little strident. And you don't want that. Um, yet you want the characters to be passionate to what's true to them. You know, they don't need to be worrying about what's going on today because that's not where they're existing. For me, so much of it was learning the, because, you know, I knew about the McCarthy era in general. I thought I had a grasp on what happened, but I didn't. And so that was the interesting thing to me is to illuminate exactly what happened and, and who did it and how it was done and what the repercussions were. And and let that speak for itself. Yeah. Um, the and is that where editing comes in? Where um, you know, you you write and you you kind of say what's on your heart, uh, but then you go back with a critical eye and say, okay, this is a little too much. I'm gonna. I, I said that for me. Now I'm gonna chop this out so I don't you know put this on everybody else. Yes, absolutely. And and the opposite goes as well. I remember I wrote a, a kind of a, a scene with a lot of different residents talking in in one of the hotel rooms and there's a big party going on and and you know, I had to kind of trim that and make that fit. It had to say what I needed to say without, you know, over explaining um the time period. And and at the same time for me, I also have to go back sometimes and and add more detail in or more more about what the, the character is thinking or feeling in that moment so that the reader can connect to that. Um, so it's a, it's a mix of both of, of putting in more detail where I need to, and then pulling out extraneous stuff. Right. The story uh, goes from the 1940s to the 1960s. Um, we talked earlier about uh, that. There are all these different uh, time periods that you would love to write in. Um, we know that we have the, kind of overarching framework of, of the, the blacklist that, that, that you work with in here. But how do you decide where the, the beginning and end will be? Um, when you're talking about a place with this big history, and, and I know we have this framework that you've chosen, but how do you, how do you choose when to bring it in and when to fade that out and to, and to let us just carry our own imaginations uh, from there? Um, you mean in, in the other time periods? Yeah, well, just like in the in choosing this this period to write from, and and this is the period you're going to highlight. Um, how do you how do you choose where to to let the story end? Yeah, yeah, I that's interesting. You know, for me, I I if this is book. The structure is a little different from my other books that went back and forth in time from one time period to another and then back. And here, it's two characters. Right in the same time period, but jumping back and forth in each of their perspectives on the same thing, um, which was a really fun kind of challenge and um, something new for me to do. So they're going back and forth in 1950, and then it jumps to 1967, and again, going back and forth from their perspective. And, and I just really wanted to capture the late 60s. 
um, at the Chelsea Hotel, and it gave the characters enough time to have let what happened in the past sink in and have some resonance and, and for the world to have moved on from the blacklist and kind of trying to forget it, you know, oh, yes, that happened, but it's over now. Um, but for some people, it wasn't. And, and so 67 was just a, an also by then the manager's son had taken over running the Chelsea hotel who, who from all accounts was a huge crazy character. And so it was fun to, to try to bring him to life. Um, and, and to see how the, the hotel had changed over the, over those years. That's so awesome. Um, Fiona, you have always very generously given us a little tease of the next place you're writing about, uh, what's coming up next. Sure. So the next book is set at the New York Public Library. Oh, wow. And, um, yeah. And I learned that in the like 1910s, um, the superintendent actually lived in that building in a seven-room apartment with his family. He had a wife and kids. And I thought, oh, that's kind of interesting to have someone living in that, you know, enormous palace in a way. And so it's from the point of view of, of the superintendent's wife in 1913, and then also from the point of view of a curator in 1993 who's trying to mount an exhibit. Um, and, and I learned so much about the library and the, the time periods and um, that it's, I'm, I'm looking forward to, to working on it and getting it out next year. So awesome! Just take my money already. I'm, I'm all I'm all in on the on the New York Public Library. That's amazing. Um, the new book, The Chelsea Girls, uh, is out everywhere now in audiobook and hardback and Kindle edition. Uh, Fiona, thank you so much for coming back on the show. Um, if people are just learning about you, God forbid, uh, where can they find you to dig into your back catalog and read about upcoming news? Sure. I'm on the internet at FionaDavis.net and on Facebook at um, Fiona J. Davis. Or no, Fiona Davis author. <laughs> I should really know this. <laughs> um, and on Instagram at, as Fiona J. Davis. So yeah, I do a Google search, you'll find me. Excellent. We'll put links to all of it in the show notes. Uh, Fiona, thank you so much for taking time to come back on the show. Thank you, and thank you for everything you do. We, All of us authors truly appreciate it. Thanks for tuning in to the Author Stories podcast. Be sure to subscribe at hankgarner.com or on your favorite podcasting app. Now stay tuned for an audiobook excerpt from Richard Gleaves, the Jason Crane series. Jason and Joey took their food trays outside and sat high above the parking lot on the secluded stairwell that had become their lunchtime hangout picking at their Thanksgiving specials and swapping updates. They were almost finished eating before Jason managed to screw up the courage to say what he needed to. I want to apologize. Joey looked puzzled. What the hell for? Because your coma was my fault. Yours? The horseman beamed me. You didn't. Hey, want to see something cool? Look what I found on my phone. Joey produced the device, hit a few buttons, and swiped his finger. An orange circle hung in a field of black, overexposed, something that had been moving fast when the flash caught it. I was trying to get his picture, right? Like an idiot? Well, I didn't get him, but that is the pumpkin he threw at me. Jason stared at the blurry orange shape for a long time. Cool. Cool? Can you imagine if we actually got a picture of the headless horseman? We'd be famous by now. He pocketed the phone. Hey, do you want the rest of this turkey? It looks like bologna. Tastes like bologna, too. He speared the slice anyway. Look, this is going to sound weird, but... I think I made you a target. What do you mean? I made you a target by... By telling you about my gift. It's some sort of magical rule. If we reveal ourselves to a normal person, whoever we tell becomes a target for ghosts. And usually... They die. And you told me anyway? No, I'd already told you. There was no way to untell you. Don't be mad. It all worked out, right? Right? Joey's expression had darkened. Give me a second here. And there's a bright side. What bright side? Now you'll have a gift too. Me? That's what your coma was. 
some kind of transition. You got targeted, but you survived. You'll be a founder now, like Ichabod. You'll pass your gift to your kids like he passed his to me. Joey looked worried. What kind of gift will I get? People get gifts that complement their natural abilities. It could be anything. Anything? So, I could read minds? I guess. Turn purple and levitate? Probably not. Something that expresses the essential you. Then I'll have an actor's gift. I want... What's an actor's gift? Jason shrugged. Super narcissism? Shut up. So you're not mad? Joey was shaking with excitement. Mad? This is the coolest thing ever! We'll be like the dynamic duo, fighting supernatural foes up and down the eastern seaboard. Jason laughed, feeling epic relief. I thought you'd be pissed. Nah. What's a little coma between friends? He took a bite out of a nutter butter, grinning madly. I'm going to be a superhero. But you can't tell anyone. Why not? Weren't you listening? Everyone we tell dies. You can't talk about your gift to anybody. But if they were targeted and lived, we could have our own X-Men. Yeah, or all your friends could die. Do you want to risk that? No, I guess not. But I don't do closets very well, you know? I came out at conception. Promise to keep it to yourself. Yeah, yeah. Joey shifted sideways and walked his sneakers up the brick. So, the essential me. Ooh, I know what gift I'll get. I'll get a singer's gift. What's a singer's gift? Jason shrugged. Superhuman drug tolerance? Shut up!